What is up, Earth's mightiest subscribers? It's Ernie, Blurred Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video, I'm gonna do something that I've been promising to do for quite some time, and I've been incredibly behind on it, but thank you for bearing with me, because in this video, we are gonna be talking about the finale of The Immortal Hulk by Al Ewing and Joe Bennett, and we're actually gonna be covering not just Immortal Hulk number 50, but I'm also gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that were going on in Immortal Hulk number 47, 48 and 49 leading up to issue number 50. So in this video, we'll be talking about why the Avengers were going so hard in the paint to fight the Hulk, regardless of whether or not the Hulk was threatening them or not. We're also going to talk about exactly how Bruce created the Joe Fix-It altar. We're also going to learn which version of Bruce Banner's altars Betty is truly in love with and which team of superheroes will help the Hulk travel to the below place to stop the leader and the one below all, once and for all. We're going to talk about all this and more right now, but first, if you want to see more awesome videos like this one, make sure you hit that subscribe button because I post multiple videos throughout the week, plus live stream the Blur Cape every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And make sure you tap that bell button, that way you don't miss anything. Also, if you enjoy the video, I humbly ask that you Hulk smash that like button because it really helps the channel out. That said, let's talk about the finale of The Immortal Hulk. You can't see me, you see me, wondering how I reach more evolutions than Okay, so the first thing that I kind of want to address here is, and this is something that kind of came up a little bit, every time that the Avengers, and there's really only like the two times, but both times that the Avengers faced off with the Immortal Hulk, especially towards the end of Immortal Hulk number 46, leading into issue number 47, and even once again in Immortal Hulk issue number 49, both times it kind of seemed like the Avengers were uncharacteristically aggro with the Hulk. Now, to be fair, he had destroyed some things, and he is technically dangerous and Gyrick has kind of made Hulk out to be the bad guy in a lot of this, but we know deep down that the Hulk is not the one that they need to be concerned with, and that right now the Hulk is dealing with something that not even the Avengers could handle, and that's the combined might of the leader and the one below all. Right now, everyone just seems way too into the idea of killing him. Now, granted, you would expect characters like Blade to not really have any kind of love loss for Banner or the Hulk because he's not incredibly close with him, but characters like Thor and even even Black Panther, for that matter, just seem to be way too into the idea of killing him. Now, of course, the Avengers have every right to feel the way they feel about the Hulk because, yes, the Hulk is somebody, if left unchecked, could do a lot of harm, and he has done some harm, even while trying to do good things, because remember that the Hulk, very recently, in the pages of Immortal Hulk number 35, the Savage Hulk had unleashed a gamma explosion. Now, granted, this was due to some manipulation by the leader, but as far as all the television cameras and news media were concerned, they didn't see the subtle nuances of the leader manipulating the Hulk through Rick Jones' body. All they saw was the Hulk unleash an explosion that killed hundreds, if not thousands, of innocent people. Now, of course, that in and of itself is not alone, but there's even something that's hinted at in Immortal Hulk number 49 when Jackie McGee is musing about the fight between the Hulk and the Avengers that it seemed like maybe the Hulk himself had some kind of an effect on the Avengers that maybe being in his presence is what actually made them aggressive. Now, granted, she may be speaking figuratively and not literally, but there's even a point where she says that just being near them very likely made them angry, and that eventually, at some point, all of the Avengers just launched into an attack against the Hulk, and that she doesn't even really know which Avenger even threw the first punch, or if it was even the Hulk that threw the first punch. But she even talks about how there's very likely a reason as to why they were doing it that maybe they saw themselves in the Hulk and that that reflection staring back at them angered them. I mean, once again, she could be speaking figuratively. She could be speaking literally. It's hard to say. That said, right now, if you're wondering which altar of the Hulk has been in the driver's seat, if you haven't caught up with any of my other videos or have been reading the Immortal Hulk up to that point, right now, it's not Banner who's actually in the driver's seat. Banner and Devil Hulk at this precise moment are in the below place. They are being sapped of energy by the leader who has been consumed by 
the one below all. Right now, the Hulk that's actually in charge right now is Joe Fixit, or right now in this current incarnation, he's evolved to become Sunshine Joe. This is now a Hulk who is powered by cosmic radiation, something that used to be a huge problem for the Hulk. It used to be something he was incredibly allergic to and was one of the Hulk's few true weaknesses, but now Joe Fixit is now able to harness cosmic radiation to make himself more powerful, and he is, for all intents and purposes, become a more powerful Hulk, maybe even more so than Devil Hulk, or Savage Hulk for that matter. But we already kind of talked about the transformation of Sunshine Joe into a cosmic power Howard Hulk. However, what we haven't talked about is where Joe Fix's persona actually comes from. By the time that we get to Immortal Hulk number 48, after Joe and Betty in their gamma mutate forms just got done clapping each other's cheeks, this leads to some truth telling between these two characters, a conversation that is probably years, if not decades in the making, because at this particular point, they still kind of harbor some grievances with one another, Betty probably more so than Banner. But during this conversation, during a talk where Betsy is reflecting on some events that took place in Incredible Hulk number 466 back in 1998. She mentions that Banner had avoided her for months and then when he finally got the courage to face me, when he got me killed, it woke up what was inside, the gamma and everything else I'd been absorbing for years. What this is very likely referring to is the death of Betty back during that run. She had discovered around that time frame that her relationship with Banner and her always being in close proximity to Banner caused her to suffer gamma radiation poisoning. Granted, this isn't exactly what killed Betsy, at least, you know, her association with Banner, but it was actually the Abomination who gave her a deadly blood transfusion in order to kill her because he became aware of this gamma poisoning and he wanted to get revenge on the Hulk and this was the greatest way to do it. And then later on, we would discover that this gamma radiation poisoning would eventually had awoken the gamma mutation with in Betty that she had garnered after all that time. This leads to a conversation where they go back and forth talking about how all they ever do is hide their feelings from one another and hurt each other. Of course, hiding themselves from one another. This leads to Bruce revealing that the reason why he created the Joe Fixit persona was because it stems back to his childhood when Brian Banner used to beat the brakes off of him and abused him terribly. He even goes on to talk about how he would watch television and he would see in these old black and white movies, he would see this character that just reeked of coolness and awesomeness and strength. This guy who seemed to be above it all. This guy who would always crack jokes and he could always defend himself. He was someone who seemed invincible. And that is where the Joe Fixit persona comes from. And it's kind of a very sad thing to think about. The fact that this kid was getting abused so much. He was being beaten nearly half to death by his father on such a regular basis that he saw this guy on television and this is what he thought that a man was supposed to be, what a grown-up was supposed to be, and that is how Joe Fixit became a reality, paving the way for what was originally the Grey Hulk. But getting back to the conversation that he's having with Betty, it also drags out the revelation that Betty has feelings for one particular aspect of Banner more so than any other, and I'm drawing this conclusion largely because, you know, we always say you hurt the ones you love, and typically the ones who you love the most hurt you the most. And Betty reveals when Bruce faked his death and became Joe Fixit, what Betty is referring to is roughly around the time of Incredible Hulk number 346, where Banner and the Hulk were assumed to have been killed by a gamma bomb when in reality they had just been transported to another world. And when the Hulk returned, he returned as Joe Fixit, but he didn't really reveal that he was back to anybody. And that's something that incredibly hurt Betty because he created this whole life for himself in Las Vegas that he didn't share with her. And she believes that this wasn't Banner per se, but she believes that Joe Fixit was the one who hurt her more than anybody else ever could have, even more than Bruce. And even going back to earlier in this encounter, this is why Betty feels the way she does about him. This is why it's safe to say she actually cares more about Joe Fixit than Bruce himself, that if she could have it her way, that Joe Fixit is the one she would want to be with in the end, despite the fact that he's hurt her more than Bruce ever could. We also can't forget the way that Bruce has been looking at her lately throughout Al Ewing's run on Immortal Hulk. Whenever Bruce and Betty would be in the same room with one another, Betty would often be in her red harpy persona, and Bruce didn't like looking at her that way. He would never come out right and say it, but for all intents and purposes, he found Betty's red harpy persona unattractive. But we also learn in this issue
issue that Betty realizes that Joe has always been the one to see the real Betty no matter what she looked like and that also probably goes a really long way to making her feel the way that she feels about him. Even saying that you always see the real me no matter what. Now that said, which team of superheroes are going to help the Hulk? Well clearly it's not going to be the Avengers. They still want to take the Hulk down and they actually go out of their way to do battle with the Hulk every chance they get to try to kill him, to end him once and for all, but leave it to Marvel's first family to be the ones to actually see to reason. And I won't even say so much Marvel's first family, but more the thing being the one who's going to see to reason. Now we can't forget in Immortal Hulk number 41, Joe fix it and the thing had a heart to heart conversation after beating the dog snot out of each other. They begin talking about religion and things experiences with death and his resurrection, how it's so much more different from what Banner and his altars have been going through because where Thing died and went to heaven, Banner and his altars, when they die, they go straight to hell. Thing realizes what Banner has been going through with his altars, the whole one below all thing. While he may not completely understand it, his death experience has kind of given him unique perspective on all of this. And it's Thing who is able to bring the Fantastic Four in and help save him from the Avengers and give him access to what is called the Forever Gate, something we saw cropped up in Dan Slott's Fantastic Four, number 25. A gate that operates very similar to the Krakoan gates that we talk about on the X-Men side of things, but this gate does just take you anywhere where there's another gate on the other side. This gate will take you anywhere in space or time that the user could wish for. This means that Joe is going to throw himself into the below place and save Banner and Devil Hulk, as well as destroy the leader and the one below all once and for all. But the more interesting aspect of this to me is the fact that Jackie McGee wants to come along for the ride, a character who has, for the most part, been by Banner's side almost since Immortal Hulk began. But the question is, what role will she play in all this? What role does she hope to fulfill diving into hell itself to help Banner? Does she feel like she owes him something? This is something that she didn't necessarily discuss with anybody before she did it. As the Hulk was getting ready to step through the gate, she simply threw herself in with him because she wanted to see this through to the end. She still has questions that haven't been answered. Questions about why the Hulk is the way that he is. Why does he exist? Why has he destroyed so many things? And why is she so infinitely connected to him? To make matters even more interesting, going through the gate almost instantly begins to split the Savage Hulk from Joe Fixit as they start to become two separate entities. The Savage Hulk being the green giant we've always known, whereas Joe Fixit looks more like Thunderbolt Ross when he's in his Hulk persona. As they travel through the below place, when they enter the sanctum of the leader who has you know, become consumed by the one below all, we discover all of these different entities from yesteryear. Of course, we see Brian Banner, and of course, Jackie McGee sees her father, but all people who have died in the wake of the Hulk. We even see characters like Jarella, Clay Quarterman. We see characters like Flux. Gargoyle, the space parasite. We even see a glimpse of Glenn Talbot, who some of you may or may not recognize as the guy who Thunderbolt Ross tried to set Betty Ross up with. But in this, yeah, he's seen all of these different people whose lives he has touched, even seeing Samuel Stearns the first. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys fair warning. I'm about to go off into the weeds a little bit because there's a really cool reason why Hulk is seeing one of the leader's distant relatives in a place where he's seen pretty much all people he's connected to in some way. I promise it's going to be worth it. But to talk about this, we have to talk about a side story that plays out surreptitiously throughout the events of Immortal Hulk number 50. There's a side story that's going on in this issue that focuses on two brothers, both Robert and Samuel Stearns, one being a man of God, that being Robert Stearns, and one being a man of science, that one being Samuel. It's very interesting when you think about it because, yeah, we know that the lead Leader's true name is Samuel Stearns, so we know that that kind of throws in a little bit more of a connection to that, that history, his ancestry there. But what I thought was very interesting about that is the rivalry between these two characters. Throughout the course of this comic, we learn that both Robert and Samuel have some kind of enmity between them. There's something that happened that has caused both of these brothers to not be exactly on friendly terms. Well, at least one of them feels that way. The other doesn't really seem to know what's going on. Now, now, 
Samuel is this scientist who's been delving into gamma radiation. Now, considering this was back in 1901 and gamma radiation had literally just been discovered by Paul Villard, this is at a point where it's yet to be named and Samuel Stearns is thinking about trying to sneak his way in and try and get the jump on this new discovery because he feels like gamma is the way of the future and he believes that gamma radiation is going to make them all incredibly filthy rich as well as immortal, though I think what he means by immortal is that immortalizing them in history. Not so much literally, though little did he know it would actually make Gamma mutates immortal in the future. Both of these men, who are, mind you, married, Samuel being married to Anne Stearns, while Robert is married to a woman by the name of Beatrice. And it turns out that due to the work that Samuel has been doing, this working with Gamma radiation, the weird places that is taking him, Anne has decided to get away from him taking their child Philip and completely distancing themselves from Samuel, which led him to feel incredibly lonely, something that Robert's wife, Beatrice, also felt. Because Robert is a man of God and he is, for all intents and purposes, a diehard, God-fearing man who just is completely thrown into his ministry and doesn't really have time for anything else. He's grown incredibly cold towards his wife, Beatrice, and this has pushed her into the arms of his brother, Samuel. Now, of course, Robert is no fool. He knows this, and he takes an opportunity while Samuel is going on pontificating about the possible future that Gamma is going to give to the world, and he kills Samuel, revealing that he knew about Beatrice and Samuel's infidelity, and then later on in the comic, kicking out Beatrice, who we've learned in this issue, is pregnant. Now, of course, if you do the math and you realize the situation going on here, Beatrice tries to convince Robert that the child is his, and granted, I think even though Robert is delusional by this point, even he is not delusional enough to believe that the child is his because I think he is keenly aware that he and his wife have not been together in quite some time. But Samuel and Beatrice have, so it's very likely Samuel's child, not his. And he puts her out in the cold, and it's here that we learn who this woman truly is. Now, while her last name is Stearns by marriage, her maiden name is Banner. This changes things dramatically when you start to think about the connection, the forever connection between Samuel Stearns and Bruce Banner. This makes them family. Okay, so now with that out of the way, you now know why Hulk is seeing one of Samuel Stearns' distant relatives in the below place. But he's not the only important person that one of the Hulks sees. Joe Fixit actually notices another particular individual who is of interest to him, Mike Baron Getty, the guy who was a father figure to Joe Fixit. But ultimately, this is where Jackie McGee comes into play. While the leader and the one below all are able to manipulate the Savage Hulk into trying to kill Joe Fixit, Jackie is the one who's able to use her newfound gamma sight to see through the illusion of everything that's happening, going as far as to seeing the child form of Bruce Banner inside of the Savage Hulk and how Stearns is manipulating everything everything, and she's able to unleash a gamma wave that disrupts the leader and the one below all, giving both Hulks a chance to separate Samuel Stearns from the one below all. And Stearns, we realize, has been an unwilling participant in all of this. Now, yes, his gamma mutated form was definitely on board for a lot of this, but he was being manipulated by the one below all. And in the end, all the end of this, we discover that, yes, yeah, Samuel Stearns has learned things that he wishes he didn't know, and he's He's kind of become a blabbering shell of his former self. Not only that, but we discover that the one below all is not truly the reason why all of this is happening, or technically he is, but there's someone else also manipulating things behind the scenes. Throughout this series, Al Ewing has been planting seeds that have been basically spelling out that the Hulk, as well as other instances in you know, religion and mythology and all other things in life, there's always two sides to a coin. And one of the things that kept coming up was, are you Gabura or are you Golachab? Now, I'm not going to sit here and try and pretend that I know a whole lot about the Kabbalah, but what you do need to know is that Golachab and Gabura, they are two different sides of the Tree of Life. And what we learn in this is that it's it's not just the one below all who has basically been manipulating everything that has been plaguing the Hulk all this time, even going back to some of his earliest inceptions, but it's also been the one above all. And for those who aren't familiar, the one below all and the one above all are basically Marvel's manifestations of the Roman Catholic devil and God, respectively. 
this is where we get into some really existential mumbo jumbo, but basically the Savage Hulk, his question to both the one below all and the one above all is, why does the Hulk exist? Why does the Hulk break everything that he touches? Why does he hurt his friends? Why is it that the people he loves have to suffer because he exists? And it's here that while the one below all now revealing himself as the one above all, the one above all basically absolves Hulk of his guilt in a roundabout way of speaking. That's basically what happens. The way I kind of took it in the one above all and the one below all kind of explains it this way is that they are both a creator and a destroyer. And that's kind of how the Hulk is envisioned that Banner is a creator, Hulk is a destroyer. They even go into talks about him you know, once again going into the are you Gibura or are you Golachab? Are you a creator or are you a destroyer? Speaking of which side or what thing Hulk will decide that he will ultimately become, that's kind of what the whole question here is. Are you a creator? Are you a destroyer? Are you merciless or are you able to show mercy? And I think what makes this more interesting is that while Joe Fixit and Jackie McGee feel like the one above all is not giving them the true answer to their question, the truth of the matter is, is that what the one above all has been trying to explain to the Hulks as well as Jackie McGee is that it's not up to the one above all to answer the question for them. It's up to them to determine whether they are Gabura or are they Golachab? Are they strength or are they mercy? And Hulk answers the question for himself. Using this opportunity to give forgiveness to Samuel Stearns, a man who has caused Hulk, especially the Savage Hulk, more pain and suffering, not just only throughout their publication history, but Samuel Stearns has manipulated Hulk in so many ways throughout the course of Immortal Hulk, playing with his emotions, toying with his emotions, emotionally torturing him in ways that are unforgivable. Now, granted, Samuel Stearns was under the influence of the one below all slash the one above all. He was working through this higher and lower power. But regardless of all of that, Hulk is willing to give Samuel Stearns another chance to show mercy rather than strength and prove that Hulk isn't just one thing. He's not just a mindless destroyer. He's not just a being of pure raw strength, but that he also has the capacity to be a creator and a person of mercy. And while we're talking about creating moments of mercy and forgiveness, it's also a moment for Joe Fixit to make amends with Jackie McGee, because one of the things that's never really ever been fully 100% addressed is the fact that Hulk is the one that destroyed Jackie McGee's life that basically put her life on a collision course with everything that is happening now. His destroying her home when she was a child was kind of the catalyst that kickstarted everything, taking her along this downward spiral path. Now, granted, it wasn't all terrible. She became an incredible reporter, but her family life became so disheveled by the fact Hulk had caused them irreparable harm, destroying her home, putting her father in a financial bind, and he just never never really ever recovering from it. To the point that Joe Fixit makes Jackie McGee a promise. A promise that whatever happens, no matter what, he knows he can never make things right. He can never go back and change the past. But what he can do is make a promise that no matter what happens, no matter what she needs, no matter what trouble she finds herself in, Joe Fixit will be the one to come and make things right. No matter what, all she has to do is say the word and he will do whatever it is she needs doing. This is all about duality. And I, once again, I know a lot of people got kind of turned off by this reveal at the end of Immortal Hulk, but it was something Al Ewing was honestly setting up since the very beginning. And I know a lot of people are even more angry at what Donny Cates has done with the whole kind of seemingly ignoring a lot of what happened with Immortal Hulk. But honestly, this was a very difficult act to follow because in the end of all this, we learn that Banner is able to escape from the Mindscape and kind of find a new lease on life. He seems happier now. He's actually smiling. Life seems to have nothing but infinite possibility for him. But honestly, I kind of feel like, yeah, Banner got his chance to walk away happy, but we still don't really fully know what it is that set off Banner and the Hulk as far as Donny Cates' run goes. So I say let's give it a chance and just see what happens because we still have other questions that Donny Cates could potentially answer, like what is going to become of Samuel Stearns, who seems to no longer have the incredible intellect that he once had. Or who knows, maybe it's still there. Maybe it's just waiting 
waiting to be unleashed. Whether or not that still carries on in anything related to Donny Cates' run as a whole other story. Another question that we have here is what is going to become of the character of Jackie McGee? Will we see her in the future? I doubt we'll see her in Donny Cates' run of the Hulk, but who knows? He could surprise us. We know that he's already introducing some interesting new concepts. He's also going to be introducing a new, I guess, Hulk persona, some other piece of the Hulk that was buried down deep that we've never seen before. But as far as Jackie McGee, I wouldn't hold my breath looking for this character to return anytime soon, though I would not be upset if we actually do see her sooner rather than later. But in the end, I thought it was really cool. It's a very fun story. It wasn't the way I expected it to go, and I'm not going to sit here and lie and say that I thought it was the greatest thing ever. In a lot of ways, honestly, I feel like the ending left a lot to be desired, but I don't think it was a bad ending. I just think that the journey was way more interesting than the destination that we ultimately wound up getting to. But that said, let me know what you thought about the finale of the Immortal Hulk and the series as a whole. Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.